unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Let's 
Romans 8.28 Romans 8.28 If you're there you say Amina 1, 2, 3, let's go And we know That all things work Together for good To them that love God To them who are called According to his purposes Read again For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called, are called according to his purposes. Praise God. That's a famous scripture and I know many of you have read it over and over. But tonight there's a certain light I feel the Lord wants to cast. Praise God. You know the word of God, it's new every day. Sometimes the things I read and I'm like, okay, now that when I think I've known everything about it. And then the next day you see things from another direction. And that's why I still God every day surprised me. The psalmist says, open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things in thine law. It's, 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 the word of God is not limited. We are limited by vision. Are we together? This thing you read every day in the Bible, it's not limited. Because the Bible says... Every scripture is profitable. For what? For a proof. For, let's read. 2 Timothy 16 says, Every scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration and profitable. Every scripture. Every scripture. Every scripture. Every scripture is profitable. Every scripture is profitable. And it can inspire for instruction. It can reprove. It can convict. It can correct, it can discipline, it can train. Praise the Lord. The man holy in conformity to the will and thought and purpose and action of God. And the next verse says that you might what? That the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Healing the sick is a good work. Casting out devils is a good work. Doing ministry, doing all great things in this world is all a good work. But that's the essence of the gospel. Every scripture is profitable. 
So when the psalmist says that, open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things in your word or your law, it means the problem is not, the, the word itself is not limited. Our perception is what? Is limited. Praise the Lord Jesus. Not that one. There's another scripture that speaks of opening the eyes of a man that he might see the wondrous works or the wondrous things in the law. But it means that, see, the word of God is, everybody has a Bible in their hands. You understand? But not everybody sees from the word. Not everybody perceives from the word. Not everybody understands from the word. Are we together? But when the Lord opens your eyes to see in the spirit through his word, yes, open thou mine eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. Yes, that's what I say. Psalms 119 verse 18. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things. I think, give it to me in the Amplified. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The message? Open my eyes so I can see what you show me of your miracle wonders. Yeah, I think that's what I wanted. He says, open my eyes that I might see what you show me. You know, as the word of there is, is like a light, isn't it? He says, your word is the light. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, right? So when the word of God comes out of God, every time it illuminates, it is ready to give knowledge, right? It's ready to give knowledge. But the way the message says is, I can see. The problem is not that you don't illuminate this light. The problem is, am I seeing what you're releasing in my life? Am I, am I seeing everything I'm reading? Or am I reading the Bible like I'm reading newspapers? You understand? I'm receiving information. The gospel is not information, it's revelation. That means every time your eyes are opened, things are unveiled before you, and then you see wondrous things. Are you hearing me? And when you see great things, and that's why I tell people, the primary life of a praying Christian should be to revelation, not cars, not houses. Many of you pray the wrong way. You seek what must seek you and forget what you must seek. I don't know if I'm making sense. Some of you are asking for different things. But the Bible says, pray to me that I might show, I might show you great and mighty things. You pray to me and I show you some things. Because the Bible says that the things that are hidden are of the Lord. But the revealed things are for us and our what? And our children. So he says, call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things. And the Bible says they are fenced and hidden in. Which you do not know. And do not distinguish and recognize and have knowledge and of understanding. You just pray. Your problem is not a job. Your problem is revelation. Your problem is not healing. Your problem is revelation. Your problem is not that you fail to, 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 to settle. Your problem is revelation. He sends his word and does what? Heals our diseases. The Bible says, the Bible says, he sent a word to Jacob and it lit the whole of Israel. He sent a word to Jacob and it lit the whole of Israel. When he sends the word to Jacob, you, the physical man, it lights up your spirit. And when he lights you up, what happens? You start shining in this dark world. But stop praying for certain things. There are certain things that follow a man who knows God. What? It's simple. There are certain things that follow a man who knows God. He says, and these things shall follow them. These things shall follow them. Paul says, brethren, we are persuaded of greater things. Things that accompany your salvation. And of these things we speak. We speak of things that follow. That, you see, there are things I always tell people that are supposed to follow you because you're born again, primarily. He says we are persuaded. We, we, are not, we, we don't even need to convince you that you're going to be a success in this world. It's already too late. You are a success. Why? Because you're begotten of an incorruptible seed. It liveth in you. It abides in you forever. You cannot take this stuff every day and not get high. And you can't get high on it and not look it. Are you hearing me? He says give yourself wholly to these things. And he says that thy profiting might be evident among all. Now I love the way the scripture puts it. He says that your profiting may appear to all. You understand? He didn't say that you may testify. No. He says that your prophet may appear to all. I love it when something happens in your life and a guy is watching you and he says there is something happening on this guy. Somebody say it's mine. See, it's wonderful when you're telling people something that doesn't show on you. But it's another thing when it shows too much on you. <laughs> that your prophet appears. And people start to look at you and they say there is something happening to you. You're not the person I knew last year. Under these circumstances, you would have died. You would have crunched and fallen. But I see you're bigger and stronger than I thought. Yes. 
Because that's what the word of God does. Somebody say it's working in me. It's working in the inside of me. So, the essence of his word is it's always that it's available for any man who is hungry. I, when I was in university, that was the prayer I always prayed. If you go through our cell meetings, every time they used to come to prayer, my prayer request one, to know God. You, if, we used to keep books many years ago. I don't have prayer requests of I want to pass and get a job. I'm believing that when I apply, I, no, no, I've never put any prayer requests like that. If you go through the oldest things in our cells when we used to meet back in those days, it was always to know Him. It was always to know Him. Because I was not planning to share something, but let me share it because the Holy Spirit inspires me too. There is a place where the things of this world become so small for you to ask. Do you remember the scripture that says, and of those things which were profited unto me, I counted lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Do you remember the scripture? And for whom I count all things but done that I may win Christ. Huh? Give me the message of that. You're going to love the way the message put it. The message says, Yes, all the things I once thought were so important, important, sorry, are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as master. First hand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant, dog down. I've dumped it all in trust so that I could embrace Christ. There was a time we thought certain things important. But those things are not important anymore. They become very unimportant. Let me tell you, when you get God and He contains you and He fills you and He... Some of you are asking for the wrong things. When you get God and He gets inside you and fills you, you don't need anything in this world. You don't need anything in this world. Why? Because the sins of this world start to attach themselves to you. Why? Because creation is groaning. For the manifestation of the sons of God. There is everything in this world is waiting for the guy. When you come up and he sees you, these things have to respond to you, not the other way around. Somebody say amen. amen. So, common scripture, many of you know it, but I'm sure you said in light of it. It says, All things work together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purposes. One time I made a statement, it was just a line. But I want to pick up from there and build something very important that many of you don't un- uh, need to understand today. In this world, like all of you know in Ecclesiastes, that for every theme, there is a what? And a uh, time for every purpose under the sun. It says, everything there is a season and to every time there is purpose. You understand? That means that God lives a purpose life with you. Are we together? Are we together? The Bible speaks of a place where men make plans. In this world, you're going to wake up and say, okay, I'm planning tomorrow, I'm going to do this, the other I'm going to do it. Proverbs 19.21. Uh, give the amplified. He says, many people make many plans. He says, many plans are in the man's mind, but it is the Lord's purpose for him that will stand. I mean, in this world, you can plan anything. You can think and say, okay, tomorrow morning I'm going to buy this, tomorrow morning I'm going to build this, tomorrow morning I'm going to do that. Yes, that's all wonderful. But the Bible says, it's God's purpose for you that stands. So the quicker you understand purpose, the quicker many things start to work in your life. Somebody one time came and asked me, I told me, Apostle, I tithe, I give, I do everything right, and I'm a minister of the gospel. But I don't see power. I don't see God. I don't see increase. I don't see multiplication. I'm supposed to see because I tithe, I'm a give, I give my first fruits, I offer... I'm one of the biggest givers. I serve God genuinely and wholeheartedly, but I don't see a certain glory that has to follow my ministry as a minister. Oh, you can put whatever you do as an accountant, as a businessman at your workplace, as that administrator, that CEO, whatever you do in your workplace. And I told the person that sometimes you can do everything right, but out of purpose. You can do everything right, but out of purpose. Let me tell you something. There is always a grace and favor that operates extraordinarily on your life when you're in purpose. So when the Bible says that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to his purposes, I know you love him, but is it the purpose of God for you to be at that job? 
Is it God's will for you to be in that place? Is it God's will for you to serve that way? Is it God's will for you to serve in Kampala? Did he call you to Masaka? Has he called you to kick Gulu? Where has he called you? Where are you supposed to be? Because where you are, the blessing comes. I said, where you are, the blessing comes. I've seen people who get flights and then, you know, work under different names in the United States and they are, the person is Rita, but she works under a name of Rhoda because she needs to make a living. You understand? And, 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 and some of them make 20 years there, 30 years there, and then they buy a house probably and a little plot of land and then they come back here and they live a normal life even worse than the country they ran from. And then there are people who leave other countries and come here and make a... It doesn't make sense. Why? Because God can bless you from anywhere. If he called you to America, he will bless you in America. If he called you to Uganda, he will bless you in Uganda. It's not where you are. He didn't say you reap where you sow. He said you reap what you sow. Paul says, I know how to be full and how to be best. For in everything and in everywhere, he says, I am both what? Instructed. He says, I know how to both be a best and I know how to abound in everywhere. And in all things. Did you read that? Everywhere. Throw me in Gulu, I will make it. Are you hearing me? Throw, tell them throw in South Sudan. Don't be intimidated. Go there. Some young people write me and say, Apostle, they've written me, you give me an appointment and remember, I want to be a Tedic Panero, but they've told me to go to, to Amulata. And I tell them, God is in Amulata, go. But I, post, I thought I wanted to stay. I said, no. What do you know you're going to do in that, in that, in that district? Are we together? Listen, there are some people who are called for the states. And those ones who are called find grace there. <laughs> but if you are not called there, you might be surprised that what you sought, you took to make a living go actually starts to teach you to go back home. <laughs> purpose. Tell your neighbor, purpose. Purpose. It is key. When the grace of God comes upon a man, it comes upon a man who firstly, that's why I tell people, regardless of the abilities you have, always first ask God, where am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to be? Because where you're supposed to be will determine the blessing upon your life. It will determine the blessing upon your life. When Paul was beginning the gospel, I'll give you an example. He says, <clears throat> but when James, John, Peter, and, and, and who? And John, which seemed to be pillars of a, of a faith, in there he called him Cephas. And there's, there's a mystery there. Which seemed to be the pillars of a faith. He says, when they saw the grace bestowed unto me, to the uncircumcised, as it was given to them the circumcision, he says, they gave me and Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship. They they supported us because they saw the grace of God upon us. Peter was called to the circumcised. Paul was called to the uncircumcised. If you read the scriptures, you realize that the biggest persecutions on Paul were him going to the circumcised. Paul was not beaten for going to the Gentiles. In fact, when he went to the Gentiles that was beaten there, you realize it was the Jews from Judea. The Jews from. It wasn't the Gentiles that beat Paul. Why? Because he had the grace. I'll give you an example. You remember Macedonia? Acts? Chapter 16, verses 9. Let me show you something. He says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and what? And help us. Verse 10. And when he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. You remember? Some of you call it the Macedonian call. Right? Paul was... Pray. And then he saw a man telling him, come and what? And help us. Let me show you something in Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 8. Give me verses 1. Amplified. Second Corinthians chapter 8. Verses 1. The Bible says, now about, we want to tell you, Father, huh? Brethren, about the grace, listen, the favor and spiritual blessing of God, which has been evident, are you in the churches of? When they entered the churches of Macedonia, there was great grace, favor and spiritual blessing. 
Why? Because they were called there. And the next verse says, For in the midst of an ordeal of severe tribulation, they were not the richest though, their abundance of joy and their depths of poverty together have overflowed in wealth of lavish generosity on their part. That means they blessed the man. For I, as I can bear witness, the Bible says, they gave according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they did it voluntarily. Why? Because he was called there. Next verse. And he says, begging us, listen, most insi- ins- insistently for the favor and the fellowship of contributing in this ministration for the relief and support of the saints in Jerusalem. They were begging Paul, let, please, let us give. Yeah. Today we tell people, we spend one hour in some churches. Now, you know, if you give, Jesus will, he will love you. You, know? <laughs> you see? But he says they begged. They were begging Paul, can I bless you? He says, begging us most insistently for the fame and the fellowship of contributing to this ministration for the relief and support of the saints in Jerusalem. And he says, no was the gift of theirs merely the contribution that we expected. Listen, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us as his agents by the will of God entirely disregarding, listen, their personal interests. They gave as much as they possibly could, having put themselves at our disposal to be directed by the will of God. Why? Because he was sent there. When he goes to a Jew, they beat him up. When he goes to a Gentile, Macedonia, these guys will sell everything to give. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Do you know that Berea, that's Berea, right? The Bereans? Do you know that Berea is in Macedonia? And he says, and these were more fair than the what? The Thessalonians. Even when he found Jews in Berea, they believed. Why? Because there was a grace of the land in Macedonia yielding its substance to the man. When God sends you to a land, it yields its substance to you. When God has not sent you or when he sends you out of a land, it will not yield. You remember what he told Cain? He says, for the ground shall not yield its substance to you anymore. Why? Because it was not his place. He says, that when thou tears the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. But when you're in the right place, the ground yields to you its strength. The trees respond to you. The climate responds to you. The atmosphere responds to you. The grass responds to you. The lands respond to you. Everything starts to respond to you. All things start working together for good. Because you love him and you are called according to his purpose. Now turn back to Romans. I need to show you something. Give me the Amplified. The Amplified says, I need to define something very, very uh, deep here. He says, we are sure and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into plan, listen, for good and to, for those who love God and are called, listen, according to his design and purpose. I love the word there, design. When God created you, I want you to understand this, when God created you, the kind of design you have, the, the nature of design you carry, is not supposed to attract certain things. I don't know if I'm making sense. Before we, we go to the purpose, I want you to understand that the way God made you, the kind of design in which He designed you, that is why, people, that's why when you become so sad, you can become acutely depressed and even get to a place of bordering madness. Because God has not designed you to be stressed. He has not designed you to be out of ease, this ease, right? He has not designed you to walk out of rest. When you're a believer, your design, he says, we which have believed have entered into rest. We which have believed. When you become a believer, you're supposed to be rested. They mean that situations are not supposed to be coming. Yes, they can come, but they find a different kind of person. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Because the the way we were designed, the way we were designed, you see, you're supposed to live your life the way you were designed. 
the things that are not supposed to work against you. Why? Because the seed you've begotten of is incorruptible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But every time Paul went into a Jewish synagogue in a land that was... Listen, do you realize that everywhere he went to the Jews... Let me show you something. Do you realize that every time he went to the Jews, they... <laughs> Acts 17, eh? Verse 10. Every time he went to the Jews in Jerusalem, wherever, they used to beat him up. But even when he came to the Jews in Macedonia, in Berea, he says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by the night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Here again he goes in the synagogue of the Jews, but in Macedonia. And the next verse says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word. These were Jews. They received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. These were Jews. These were Jews. The Jews used to beat him in Jerusalem and everywhere else. When he comes in Macedonia, those Jews bow. Because I've realized when a man is not born again, he walks to the dictates of the principalities. When a man is born again, the principalities walk to his dictates. Are you hearing me? Before you're born again, you are subject to the principality and the spirit of that nation. When you become born again, the spirit of that nation bows to you. It bows to you. I don't know that you got it. I don't know whether you got it. The Jews beat him everywhere. The Jews beat him everywhere. From Judea all through Jerusalem. But when he comes to Berea, when he finds Jews and enters their synagogues, even those ones believe. Why? Because even if the Jewish blood is not for him to save, when it comes in his territory, he has the grace for it. That's why the Bible says he has made of all blood, of all bloods, all nations, one blood. He has made one blood of all nations. He has made of all nations one blood. You see, he, whatever the blood you carry, when you get into the confines of that nation, you are subject to the consequences of that nation than the blood you carry. Until you get to know God, certain things start to change in your life. Why? Because when you become born again, you're neither Jew nor Gentile. You become a man from above. You become a man from above. It means that when your citizenship is from heaven, everything under... You see, one time I read a statement, and I, I, I know that many of you read it, but you don't understand this. You remember one time I mentioned that when the devil appears to Jesus, he tells him, bow to me, for I shall give you all the kingdoms of this world. Meaning that the prince of this world owned the kingdoms. Of this world. They were all ordered under his system. Right? Under his system. The Babylonian system is all the devil and his kingdoms. Right? But see, there's a statement that comes in the scriptures one day and just the spirit of God speaks and says, for the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. I wish you understand what that means. It means that there's, 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 there's a place where God gets what the devil has ordered up for his kingdoms and systems and then he owns it through you. So, when he tells you occupy until I come, he means to say that we are here to establish the kingdom which is of God and subdue anything that has put down the kingdom. Anything that represents itself contrary to the kingdom of God. It has become. It has become. They have become. Now, he didn't say the kingdoms of this world will become. He said it will become. Because he's speaking to men on the mountain. That's why he tells the man, the revelator, that's why it's the book of Revelation, not Revelation. That book is not just telling you future experiences. No, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. When you read the book of Revelation as a revelation, not just the book of Revelation, not the total sum of the things God revealed to John, but the very spirit of Revelation. When I tell you that, oh, somebody has understood me, when I tell you that the kingdoms of this world have become, or have become, the kingdom of God, it means... They, they are become. Uh, uh, listen, it means that 
Calm down, brother. It means that when you get up here, you realize we have subdued anything that is contrary to the kingdom of God. You'll understand that everything, even in the systems of this world that is arrayed as the kingdoms of this world, is all shaken and nothing compared to what you carry in your spirit. You can wake up right now and flip a nation. Right now. You see the kingdoms of this world, they have a certain order. You can wake up right now and flip a nation. Because what the devil possessed has become of God. But then there are people who see that as a future experience. They say, ah, they will become. They are struggling to transition from the kingdoms of this world into the kingdom of our God. But that's why when, he tell, when he's dealing with John the Revelator, he first tells them, come up with that. Don't see from down. No. That's why, do you know why people are not saved? It's because some people see from the valley. That's why he says, when you lift up your head, you see, the harvest is plenty. The fields are white. That means there is a man believing God to prepare saints for salvation. There is a man who understands that God has prepared saints for salvation. There is a man who is believing for success in this world. There is a man who understands that God has already created success in this world. We have different results. Why? Because when that man who thinks he's believing God to do work stuff, he has a working process to see God do it. But the man up the mountain sees God has already done it. He walks, he says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Give me the Amplified of that. The Amplified says, he says, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. Listen, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking part which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life in which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Tell your neighbor, I'm living a good life. And I'm not sorry. Come up the mountain. <laughs> Tell somebody, come up the mountain and see. You're living a good life. He planned a good life. Some people love the bad lines in the gospel. You see, salvation is not easy. No, listen. I am for the good life all the way. And believe me, when we get to heaven, I'll be next to Paul. Because we have a lot of things to talk about. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God. Now, when I'm in that place, I realize there is no system I cannot break through. That's why when I was dealing with, 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 with the psalmist, he said, ask ye of nations. You remember? You remember? Some of you are asking for plots of land. Oh, I rebuke you. He said, ask ye of nations. He says, give me the message. You're going to love the message. He says, what do you want? See how it is. What do you want? He says, name it. Nations as a present. Continents as a price. You command. You can command all of them to what? To dance for you. Or throw them out with tomorrow's trucks. <laughs> you can. Somebody say, Europe dance for me. Africa dance for me. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody say, the Caribbeans dance for me. In the name of Jesus. Asia dances for me. In the name of Jesus. Uganda dances for me. In the name of Jesus. Africa dances for me. In the name of Jesus. What do you want? Then somebody goes on their knees and says, Father, if you can only give me a plot of land in Kampala, I will be okay. <laughs> what does the next verse say? What does the next verse say? So, rebel kings, use your heads. Upstart judge, learn your what? Your lesson. When, listen, when you understand this, I've realized we can twist any nation to do what we want. It's not selfishness, it's responsibility. (laughs) 
when the king of kings takes over those kingdoms, what do you become? <laughs> and the man of Revelation says that they've been made priests and kings and to the most high God. That's why when we receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, he says we shall reign in this life by one man, Jesus. I came to reign. Tell your neighbor, I came to reign. Mugambe, you might not understand me now, but I came to reign. I came to reign. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And all these nations will bow. Because we don't just come to reign for the world, just for people to know that we have. No, we come to reign to live the testimony of Christ. And I decree in the name of Jesus. Nations respond to you. Nations respond to you. If you got this word from today, I want to decree upon your life that nations are going to respond to your life in whichever area of your life. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I stopped asking for plots of land. It's disrespectful to God. I was telling God, thank you for Argentina. God, thank you for Spain. Thank you for Italy, my God. Thank you for France and Germany. Thank you for Somalia, Kismayo. Thank you for Mogadishu. Nations are opening. Me, I feel it. I feel it. For the gospel. For the gospel. For the gospel. In the name of Jesus. Some say, I might not be a preacher. Yes. <laughs> but you can be a consultant and preach. In your consultancy. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. The kingdoms of this world are become. They have become. That's how I see it. Somebody is believing them to become. Somebody thinks, still thinks they have effect. But to me, they are become. They are become. They are become. The kingdom of our God. Somebody say amen. amen. When God gives you a place, everything yields its substance there. The Bible says when you build a house, you sleep in it. When you plant a vineyard, the Bible says you eat of it. He says they shall not be planting and other men eat their rock. And he says, they shall not be building. He says, they shall not build and another inhabit. Oh, say, tell your neighbor, it's not mine. Come on, tell somebody, it's not mine. I will not build and another inhabit. In the name of Jesus. He says, they shall not, give me the amplified. He says, no, message, message. He says, yeah, message. They will build houses and move in. They will plant fields and eat what they want. They grow. And the next verse says, no more building a house that some outsider does what? Takes over. No more planting fields that some enemy confiscates. For my people will be as long lived as trees. I'm living low. And he says, My chosen ones will have satisfaction, not stress. Not stress. He says, They shall have satisfaction in their work. You will go back home and say, Wow. Wow. He says, They won't continue. They won't work and have nothing come of it. They won't have children snatched from under them. Men of God. Pastors. They won't have children snatched under them. For they themselves are plantings blessed by God with their children and grandchildren likewise. God bless. When you are, you, listen, if somebody submitted under me, nobody can snatch them. They can move, they still come back. Why? It's a promise. It's a promise. Say amen. Rabakota Landa. Tell your neighbor, Rubo Ziba Yanda Kole. Tell your neighbor, Rabo Stele Manda Kosa. Hey! Tell them I'm crazier than you think. Even your biological children, 
They will not be snatched by drugs. In the name of Jesus. They will not be snatched by alcohol. They will not be snatched by HIV. Cancer will not snatch them. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I believe it. Oh, I believe it. I tell that to myself every day. If they go, they're not yours. Yours can't go. If they go, they come back. Come on. It rids you of insecurity. Some of you are insecure. Oh, he left. Oh, my, my, my servant. My staff left. Oh, no, come on. They're yours. They'll return. They're not yours. Yours is there. Yours can't be snatched. The Bible says he maintains. Hey, hey, hey. My Lord. In Luganda, Gambechanga, Chikuma. Me, that's what I know. If somebody takes something of mine, uh, I say, uh, mine can't be taken. I'm telling you, somebody one time came and robbed me. I prayed them mad. They got them when they are mad. And they brought the fellow back. We used to also have a certain chap. He used to come in for never steals things, goes away. We got him one day. I, the lady called me, he's here on police. I told him, tell him to confess everything he stole. The guy refused. He passed out. <laughs> he woke up. I told him, tell him to confess. He refused. He passed out again. <laughs> he woke up three times and the police told him, we don't know what is happening to the young man. He's dying and getting up. Dying and... <laughs> I told him, okay, release them. We have forgiven him. Tell him about the Tupa. <laughs> we didn't come to this world to be robbed. No way. No way. No way. No way. We just had mercy on him because we're grace ministers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to zero down to something before we finish. When you are called to Macedonia, the grace and favor will follow you. If you are called to Macedonia and you drive your truck and go to Lystra, they might kill you. It doesn't matter how good a giver you are. That's why for me, many of my saints realize lately as I grow old, I, I'm slow in decision. And some tend to think I'm less spiritual. But I said, Pastor Zach, I told him, bigger ships. Turn slowly. There is repercussions. Of course I have faith. Are you small? <laughs> Listen, when we were 200, it was easy to make certain decisions. But when you become massive, you don't just make decisions. You have to think through and wait for God to prompt you, to tell you to do it. Some push me and they realize I don't make certain decisions. Why? Because if I've not had God... I don't want to go into it. If I hear God, I will go into it. If I don't hear God, I will delay it as long as I have to. And that's what I ask you to do. When you have to make a decision, delay it until you have to. Let God come from heaven. If he has to remove his shoes and talk to you, barefooted, let him do. But it's a bad thing when you enter, for example, a marriage, and then reach there two years and feel like you're in a prison. And then you go for counseling and nothing makes sense. But when you reach there, they tell you, who saw the Lord joins? Let no man lay asunder. And it's easy to judge them. But until you're there, you can never understand. You can never understand what it means to be in a wrong marriage. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Because everything outside, this decision will judge you. And sometimes you can believe and get to one end of believing and still believe after. Until you don't know anymore the definition between believing and delusion. Are you hearing me? Don't, don't, you tell your neighbor they're not talking about me. <laughs> tell anybody the one they're talking about didn't come. My marriage is just fine. Tell anybody my marriage is fine. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, here is the catch. I've realized that when I say that 
when you are, for example, in Macedonia or when you're in the perfect will of God, like things start to work together for good. I did not say that everything works well. I just said everything works all together. Are we together? I didn't say that everything works well, but I said everything works together if you're in purpose. In Acts, is a story I want us to read before I finish. In Acts 28 verse 1. Some of you remember in the 27th verse, Paul was being taken, he was arrested, remember? And then they hit shipwreck somewhere, and then they almost drowned. I remember in the scriptures in 27, he comes to them and tells them, be of good cheer, gentlemen, for the Lord appeared unto me this night and told me <laughs> that we shall make it, but we shall lose many a what? A good, right? So they knew the goods were going to be lost, but their lives were going to be preserved. This was Paul's faith. I don't think everyone believed him, but that's exactly what happened. Are we together? So, after that experience, they now cross uh, to the island of Malta. Verse 1. Verse 1, sir. Give me the amplifier. The Bible says, And after we were safe on the island... We knew and recognized that it was called Malta. This is him surviving water. So when they come on Malta land, the Malta guys know, oh, these guys have just survived what? Death. Are you hearing me? And that survival, somebody says, hey, you guys are what? You must be blessed. And the next verse says, and the natives saw us unusual and remarkable kindness, for they kindled the fire and welcomed and received us all, since it had begun to rain and was cold. Right? Now, Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and he was lying them down on the fire when a viper crawled out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. He was. When the natives, listen, saw the little animal hanging from his hand, they said to one another, Doubtless, this man is a what? And they didn't see the mother, they were not eyewitnesses, they didn't hear a rumor. When the thing comes on the guy's hand, they say, doubtless, this man is the one. He's a murderer. For though he has been saved from the sea, justice, the goddess of avenging, has permitted that he should what? Has not permitted that he should live. Should be. You know, you can go through things and people bury you. Oh, they bury you. Oh, they bury you. <laughs> one man said they buried us, forgetting we were seeds. We sprout out. Hallelujah. They cast you to the wolves to eat you back. You come back leading the pack. Why? Because you're something different from what they expect. There are people who think something is going to bury you and then one day they realize you're coming back a victor. They thought the wolves will eat you up. But they don't know you have an anointing that can cause them to follow you. <laughs> When, when the viper fastened its hand, itself on the man's hand, they judged. Do you know you can go through things and people start judging? God left him. That, that, eh? may I have seen. Give him like, Shorabababa. Give him, Robo. Give him like, two weeks. Oh no, two months. Me, I saw. The Lord revealed to me. Give him like one year, you'll see. <laughs> I prepared myself ten years for this. <laughs> and you think in one year it's going to die. <laughs> you know why? Because they were not there. They were not there. <laughs> They just see the finished product and don't see the process. They were not there when you were praying, when the rain hits you and you carried old bags and boys looked at you and they say, this woman doesn't have a future. When your wig used to turn and start to smell, they were not there. They just saw you on camera and they think that God began this work in you. And he's going to reach in the middle and forsake you. He said he will never leave me. 
nor forsake me. For I shall fail the Lord. He will never leave me. He is where what? The Lord is your helper. He's my helper. That's what I know about him. He's my what? He's my helper. Tell your neighbor, he'll never leave you. You see, one time I was sharing with a small group of people, and there's something that I failed to understand one time I was reading some. I told people, when you understand God well, you reach a certain place where you realize that nothing can separate you. No things present, no things to. You see, let me give you an example. I, one time I showed you the very small group of people, I told them, look, there's a scripture that humbled me. It humbled me. When Jesus was about to leave, he came to Peter and tells him, Peter, I have seen the devil. He's going to sift you. I was praying for you. He says, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And, and the Bible says, but I prayed for thee. I thought Jesus was going to say that you be delivered from the sifting. There are things God will allow for you to go through. He told him, I see the sifting. I see you're going to fall. But I'm not going to pray that you don't fall. I'm going to pray that your faith fail you not. That's why I told people, it doesn't matter how much you screw up, never leave the presence of God. Never leave the presence of God. Screw up, come back to him and tell him I'm fake. But you're my Lord. I, I cannot do it, but you're my God. I've screwed up, but you're my God. I'm filthy, but you're my God. I don't even know why this is happening to me, but you're still my God. I want to do what's right, but I find not the strength to do for in me. Seems like a man wants to do right, but I find not the strength for in me. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, but you're still my God. He told him, I prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Because what's important in this is, I don't give a damn what you're going through and what you're screwing up with and what is screwing you up. After that, I see the story. You're going to be restored. Yes, he killed Bathsheba. I mean Uriah. And took on Bathsheba. He was wrong. But he was still a man after God's own heart. And the Bible says, and he served God in his generation. The purpose of God upon your life is bigger than your weakness. He told him, I pray that your faith fail thee not. I told him, for when thou have restored, you shall restore your own brethren. It means, I see that others are also going to fall. That some are clapping right now at the failure of others, not knowing. But when Peter is out, you're going to be in and you're going to need him to restore you. Sometimes certain people have the way to help because they've been there. They've been there. They've been there. They can tell you. You understand what I'm saying? But it humbled me that God didn't take it away from Peter. He still told him your faith in all this should not fail you. Don't stop going to church because you're too filthy. Stay coming. Stay coming. You know why men judge us? It's because we welcome those people. One time I was with Pastor Isaiah and we found a young lady. She became pregnant in church and the pastors chased her out of that church. And then she went and started singing in a secular band and produced more babies and failed. And then Bishop asked her, why don't you come to church? She said, when I came to church and I made one mistake, God chased me out of the building and the devil loved me. Now she's in the world. She's in the world. Because people don't understand that God can fix any man. Any man. That's why I tell you, you might have issues. Don't leave the presence. Come. For where can you hide? Where can you hide away from him? Regardless of your situations, you come. 
He has a way of sorting you in His presence and getting that stuff out of you. But just be available. I pray that your faith fail you not. Now I want to finish. So when a viper clings on the man's hand, remember in the chapters before 27, the Bible says the angel appeared to the man and told him, you shall make it. And you shall appear before I forget who it was. So he was supposed to appear before somebody. He knew that even if a viper was to sting on his hand, it had nothing to do with his destiny. Because the prophetic word of the angel had been spoken to him. And he told him whether you want it or not, you'll make it through this journey and stand. So whatever happens in them, that's why let me tell you. Let me give you an example. They tell you that you will appear before Caesar, I think he was Caesar. Yeah? I think he was Caesar. If they told him you're going to appear before the man, whether there is a sinking or there is a viper, God says you'll appear. This is purpose. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. Whatever happens in between is insignificant. And sometimes the insignificant stuff can seem like it's going to swallow you. Because you can go through situations and feel like I think I am done. And then the God of Angel Amis comes through again. And tells you I still have plans on you. And the next verse says, Then Paul simply shook off the small creature. The Bible didn't say he prayed. No, he, he, he looked. Oh, oh, who ya? Tell your neighbor, just shake it off. I don't know what I'm talking to or who I'm talking to. Tell your neighbor, just shake that stuff off. He, he didn't even. The Bible didn't say Paul prayed. The Bible didn't say he put 40 days of fasting. No, he said he just shook it off. Why? Because whatever big thing it is, when I think of where I'm going, You cannot declare a man over when you don't know what God told you. You can't. Because you don't know what God told you. And if you probably took the same route and that stuff and beat you, you'd have died. Some people have been places where if some of you had gone, you would have died. You would have died. I, can I say it again? Some people have been places if some of you had gone there, you would have died. I know a woman who lived with an HIV positive man for four years. And after she came out HIV negative, the chap died. I looked at her, I said, Marco Reba Koya. She told me I was on nothing sexy. <laughs> Tell your neighbor nothing. Sex me. I'm a child of purpose. So, look at the beauty, the beauty of this. So he shook up the preacher into the fire and suffered no evil effects. And the Bible says, however, they were waiting, expecting to see her failing, to swell up suddenly, drop dead. But when they watched him long, a long time, and saw nothing further or harmful come to him, he changed their minds. From that they say to say, She's a God! She's a God! He's a God! He's a God! He's a God! Tell your neighbor, that's who I am! That's why I feel sorry for people who think you're going to fail. They will behold you for a long time. I say they will behold you for a long time. They'll behold you for a long time. I remember one time in the scriptures where God tells Pharaoh that I will keep you alive, that I will show you my power. You, you could have killed him, but he said, no, 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 no. Be alive enough to see me prosper. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I know I'm talking to some. I know I'm encouraging a spirit. <laughs> First Peter, the last scripture, five. First Peter five, verse six. First Peter 5 verse 6 Give me the message Be what? Be what? For who you are 
you are. And don't put on what? God's strong hand is what? Is on you. And he'll what? He'll promote you at the right time. Next verse. Live what? Carefree before God. For he's most what? Careful with you. Literally, when he's handing you, he's like this. That's how he handles you. Live free. Tell your neighbor, live carefree. Because God is most careful with you. Next verse says, keep a cool word. Yeah. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. And he says, keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on what? Faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has put great plans for us in Christ's eternal and glorious plans they are will have you put together on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. Who has the final say? I say, who has the final say? Jehovah turns your life around. Meet everyone in there. Jesus, that you cannot fail. You will never fail. You are not meant to fail. You are not designed for failure. He that began a good work in you will see to accomplishment to the day of Christ. Your children will testify. Your grandchildren will testify. Your ministry rises. Your vision rises. Your relationships rise. In the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare that you are a purpose child. You are a covenant child. All things work together for your good. Because you love him and you are called according to his purposes. I want you to give the Lord a mighty, mighty. Hallelujah. Has God spoken to you today? He has spoken to me too. And I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Listen, give me a minute before you leave. If anybody's here and you've never given your life to Christ, put up your hand and say, I want Jesus today. Say, I want to be born again. Bring them. Come, 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 come. Please, those who are standing next to them. Give them space to come. We need to see this miracle. Come on, we need to see this before you leave. People in the overflow, I don't hear you. 
You want to give your life to Christ? Come. God bless you. There are more. Come. Come. If you want to give your life to Christ, come and stand here. And say, I want Jesus today. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not next year. I want Jesus today. Come on, clap for Jesus as they are coming. All things work together for good. They work for good. You had to be here today. You had to become born again today. God bless you. I feel there are like two more people. Come. Don't fight God. It's your day. It's your day. Come wherever you are. Come. Don't fight God. Don't fight God. Come. If you're here and you say, don't fight Him. God is speaking to you. Come. Come. Come, wherever you are. Ask your neighbor, are you born again? If they say no, tell them, go. It's your day. God bless you. Hey, they are here. Somebody clap for Jesus. <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey! 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 I think God spoke to some people to put on the blood. <laughs> because it's salvation day. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died and rose again. I confess with my mouth that you're both Savior and Lord of my life. Tell him from today, I believe you're the Son of God. You died and rose again. Today, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Today, I decree before hell, before us, and heaven that I'm born of God. I receive the incorruptible seed, which is the life of God, which lives and abides forever. Amen. Come on, somebody, clap for Jesus. We are going to take your names. And then we will follow you up. Hallelujah. Praise God. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Venero, make manifest.